to this colloquium. Uh, this is an extraordinary colloquium because we have the pleasure to have for these two days as a visitor, Professor Wojciech Lipinski, uh, who has come from Australia. Um, he uh, works, his research is on solar thermal energy, chemical, optical, thermal aspects of solar energy utilization. He has a degree from the Warsaw University of Technology in Poland, a PhD from ETH Zurich. He had academic positions in Zurich at the University of Minnesota and at the Australian National University. And uh, he will be delivering a talk on uh, the prospects of concentrated solar thermal. So we are looking forward and thank you very much for visiting us. Thank you very much, Theo, for this very nice introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here and talk about my favorite topic to you. Yesterday, I visited the facilities here. I was at the coast to see the solar thermal facility, and I'm really impressed. I hope there will be new ideas that I can convey to you and that will make the research here in Cyprus more, even more exciting. Now, as Theo said, I will be talking about some aspects of concentrated solar thermal energy research. I will show you some specific examples in optics, heat transfer, and chemistry, and I promise to not bore you to death with too many details. I reserve the right to show one equation in my talk, but not more, okay? <laughs> Promised. So I love equations, but maybe later. Now, let's start with the source, and then we can go down what we can do that. So solar radiation comes from the sun, which is a natural thermonuclear reactor traveling in space. It's far away from Earth. It takes eight minutes for light to travel from the sun to the Earth. Now, it is modeled often as a black body, the perfect emitter, perfect absorber, at the effective temperature of, seven, of 5,780 Kelvin. When the light arrives at the Earth's orbit, the flux is already much lower than that emitted at the sun's surface. Originally, we have about 65 megawatts per square meter. That's a lot of energy. But it arrives at the Earth's orbit with a flux at about 1.4 kilowatts per square meter. And when this light propagates through the atmosphere, we get about one kilowatt per square meter maximum. In Australia, on sunny days, we can get more than one kilowatt per square meter because there is the ozone hole. And at some during some times of the year, this extra UV radiation that is not absorbed by ozone can contribute even 10% uh, of extra radiant energy. Now, solar energy is practically an unlimited source of primary energy. We believe that its conversion at large scale will be environmentally benign. And I'm saying we believe because we don't know. We don't have solar technologies developed at large scale. There will be an environmental impact related to materials, to glasses, precious metals, and so on. And we still think it can be, um, it can be handled in a, um, in a uh, sustainable way. Now, solar radiation has a high exergy content. It arrives to us with more than 92% uh, 90, of solar radiation can be converted into electricity or mechanical energy. But it is a low energy flux. This one kilowatt per square meter is not much in engineering applications. And it is non-uniformly distributed on the, Earth's, uh, on the Earth's surface, right? We have the solar belt. And we have also regions where there is not much sun. And I'm visiting Cyprus, fully aware that you have about 350 solar days throughout the year. And this is not by chance that this research I would like to promote here. And um, for example, not necessarily in some other areas. And radi solar radiation is intermittent. We have daily and seasonal cycles. And this is a problem. But I believe we can solve this problem with a little bit of engineering. Now, let's do a simple exercise. If we assume that the average annual solar flux is only 270 watts per square meter. This is eight hours of solar radiation divided by 24 hours for a day. Then we get 270 hours per square meter. If we can convert this energy with 20% of efficiency in order to cover all the energy needs for the whole world, which is about 19 terawatts, we would need to 
convert solar radiation from a square of about 590 by 590 square kilometers. This square is a little bit growing. I, I received this slide from my former supervisor, Professor Aldo Steinfeld at ETH Zurich years ago, and the square was 490 by 490 square kilometers. So the demand is growing, and also I have introduced here a little bit more conservative assumptions. Now, what can we do with this massive energy source? We like to use it for lighting. In solar architecture, if you use solar light in windows, you offset electricity that otherwise is needed to, um, to light rooms. Now, we can convert it in thermal processes at low temperatures for solar heating and cooling, distillation, desalination, and uh, other processing at low temperatures, including drying. We can convert it at high temperatures to produce electricity in solar thermal power plants or CSP plants, or we can produce chemicals, fuels, and materials. We can also use electricity from CSP plants to produce fuels and materials, but in thermochemical conversion, we skip the electricity pathway, and we believe this, theoretically, we can get higher efficiency, but practically there are other issues to take care of. Then photovoltaics is now booming, it's popular, and this is the direct photoelectric conversion of photons to have electric current. And then we have photochemical conversion, for example, processes for artificial photosynthesis when the energy of a photon is directly uh, engaged in fundamental chemical processes in photosynthetic uh, reactions. And we have also photolysis, photocatalysis in this group where we can produce fuels and materials. So my talk is mostly related to the photothermal conversion at high temperatures for applications in power, fuels, and materials processing. Now, the upper limit for efficiency to convert solar radiation into useful energy, we call it exergy in the mechanical engineering jargon, is given by the product of the absorption efficiency of a black body receiver and the Carnot efficiency or the efficiency of a Carnot engine. That's the upper limit in thermodynamics. This equation can be plotted, its components. The blue lines show the absorption efficiency. They decrease with temperature because there is more and more radiation. And the Carnot efficiency is the green line here. So it's increasing with temperature relative to the ambient temperature because there is more potential for work to be done in a thermodynamic system. And when we multiply the blue lines with the green lines, we obtain the red lines. I'm not sure if that works in the color theory, but in my plot, this is how to interpret this plot. Um, the red lines show the efficiency at a max, the, the theoretical limit, in function of receiver temperature for selected concentration ratios from relatively low 100 to 10,000 suns. One sun is often used as the informal unit. It's a jargon. It's not the SI unit corresponding to one kilowatt per square meter. If I see here 10,000 suns, it means it is 10 megawatts per square meter. Okay? So this plot was published by Professor Edward Fletcher in, and his student in 1977 in science. Professor Fletcher was the doctoral supervisor of my doctoral supervisor, and he was the professor at the University of Minnesota, where I worked for some time. He himself obtained a PhD degree with Herbert Brown, who got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1979. And Professor um, Fletcher also graduated many other solar researchers, such as Professor Robert Palumbo. He was, for some time, the head of the Solar Energy Lab at Paul Scherer Institute, where I conducted my doctoral research. In 2017, we organized a symposium to honor his life achievements at the AICHE, American Institute of Chemical Engineers Symposium in Minneapolis, and. Um, um, and then uh, we had there many presentations of, uh, over a couple of days. The community was together. Now, I showed you in these red lines, we have the value of C, concentration ratios. So how can, can we obtain that, right? We can use a magnifying glass, but that will not do the trick at the large scale. 
So we, we can use um, proper concentrating solar collectors. The one reflection system such as parabolic dishes, um, heliostat fields, parabolic troughs. And I'm talking in a building named after Fresnel and there is a Fresnel facility at the, on the roof. So I'm very happy, it's a very pertinent slide. Then we have multi-reflection systems with the primary concentrator and secondary reflector or concentrator such as compound parabolic concentrator. And then we have a group of optical devices which are research devices such as solar furnaces. They can be more tricky with homogenizer, secondary concentrators or solar simulators with artificial sources of light. The parabolic troughs concentrators deliver fluxes between 10 and 100 kilowatts per square meter. Towers are, uh, allow us to get higher fluxes, 100 to 1,000 kilowatts per square meter. And parabolic dishes are really optically superb. The maximum fluxes can exceed 10 megawatts or 10,000 kilowatts per square meter if they are really well done. Furnaces are used in solar simulators for research purposes with peak fluxes exceeding 5,000 and for solar simulators it's really easy to get more than 10,000 uh, suns. And if that's not enough, we can use secondary concentrators. Here we can see one that we built at a new for our reactor at a small scale to magnify the flux by at least factor larger than one. If you design a compound parabolic concentrator and C would be less than one, then it's something not good there. Now, let me show you some fact, maybe not fact, some characteristics of this concentrating solar thermal technologies with regard to the deployment potential and general characteristics of this technology versus some other renewable energy technologies. This technology is suitable for regions with high direct normal irradiation. For example, the deserts of North and South Africa. Yesterday I learned about the issue of dusting from Sahara in Cyprus and actually in the whole Mediterranean region. To me, it is the message from Sahara to solar researchers, hey, I'm here and come and harness because there is a lot of energy and that energy is basically eroding soil killing vegetation, and when there is water scarcity, things accelerate. So it's the time to do something about this. And similarly, the Gobi Desert in China and uh, the Chinese researchers, or the China, China in general, has a big forestation prog program as well to stop this uh, desert expansion. We have Mediterranean, I mentioned, Arabian Peninsula, Middle East, parts of India, North uh, and Central Australia, high plains and of Andean countries in Latin America, Northeast Brazil, North Mexico, and South West of the United States. Now, the concentrating solar thermal technologies utilize the complete solar spectrum, and that's really good, right? Because we don't throw any photons because of our on mirrors. Of course, there are selecti selective uh, absorption or selective transmission issues, but theore theoretically we work with the entire spectrum. The concentrated solar thermal technologies make use of common materials such as steel, glass, ceramics, common salts, water, carbon dioxide, air. They don't depend critically on rare earths and precious metals. And this aspect is often forgotten a little bit when we talk about all electric, ele electrifying our world, right? There is a bottleneck there and we have to keep it in mind. And solar thermal theoretically is less dependent. It does need these materials, but to a lower extent. Then we have the, uh, these technologies are compatible with large capacity thermal storage for both baseload and dispatchable operation and is compatible with main industrial applications requiring thermal energy inputs. That this much can be achieved. On simple calculations show that only 1.5% of dry areas are enough to cover global annual electricity demand with the state of the art technology even without further research or advancement. Maybe it's not the most economic solution, but it's possible. Here I'm showing the map with the cons commercial concentrating solar power plants produced by Solar Faces in September 2021. 
Blue are the operational plants, red under construction, and green development or plant. Um, China is leading the way. That's the clear message here with regard to the plant plants. There are, I believe, more than 30 mega projects announced on the website of Solar Paces. You can read the details. And these plants are built because they come with thermal energy storage, and the thermal energy storage connects solar thermal input and photovoltaics as a storage medium. And that's the way Chinese think it will stabilize the electric or the energy system in China. Similar route is taken now in Australia. There are some uh, information is published nonstop now by Australians about these findings. And I think this is where it is heading with regard to CSP, not just for solar energy source, but also the storage aspect. When we look at the research infrastructure, we can also see that there are more and more labs around the world engaging this research area. I'm showing here the map of high flux solar simulators, not furnaces or research towers. And here we can, maybe 20 years ago, there were one or two. Now we have them everywhere on every continent almost. There are two I built, one in Minnesota, one in Australia, and there are also those that my colleagues built in Europe, in Asia, and the, in the United States. The solar simulators provide, are the artificial source of light. And here we can see the example of the new device. It has 18 radiation units. The total electric power con used is 45 kilowatts. And it can have the peak output of more than 11 megawatts per square meter. When the simulator was new, it could deliver more than 20 megawatts per square meter, but then we intentionally defocused because such high flux with non-uniform distribution causes problems of hot spots. And basically this is like a cutting laser on the walls of our devices. So we make the flux more uniform with the lower peak flux intentionally. That's a rather a small simulator. Now I'm showing the sim a simulator on steroids by the German Aerospace Center called the Synlight Facility, which has 149 radiation units, also as well with xenon lamps. Now they are automated, so the positioning alignment is automated, and this facility enables simultaneous experiments in three chambers. In our ANU simulator, we had one chamber. It was well equipped with gases. It was basically a chemical fume hood with all the equipment there and radiant source input. But in the case of the German simulator, it is yet another level. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the physics of the concentrating solar thermal plants. And I promise to stay at the very top level, not to go into too many technical details. We deal here with multiple scales in space and time. The largest uh, space, space scales are associated with the concentrating collectors up to kilometers when you look at the heliostat fields or receivers together. Then we have the smaller scales in the, with the receivers, reactors, and even smaller scales with the, what we have in the reactors. These can be components, participating media, porous media, tubes, um, heat transfer media, and so on. And then we have the parts of those components, for example, individual particles, pores, struts. When we look at this map of the different scales, we see that, well, we know by studying it that the physics of transporting energy, momentum, and mass changes drastically from the large scale to the small scale. At the largest scale, we have basically electromagnetic radiation only. Then we have less radiation, which doesn't require any matter to propagate through space, and more material-bound transport phenomena, such as conduction, convection, heat transfer, mass transfer, transport of chemical species in chemically reacting um, systems. I will start now with the few examples, and I will talk about this example for the optical design at the largest scale when we have just light. Then I will show two examples uh, related to receivers and reactors, and then I will sw switch to the solar thermochemistry. 
So I'm showing here some examples of the large scale concentrating solar uh, power plants. We can see there are different types, sizes, configurations. To optimize these systems is a very interesting task in optical engineering. We typically use we typically use optical simulation tools based on the Monte Carlo method, such as um, Tonatiu, Solstice, Solstice, Tracer, and uh, programs developed um, by researchers. I always push my own students to write their own programs, and initially, the, perhaps the learning curve is harder, but after some time, it's a lot of fun. We are free to modify the design and to actually optimize. Very soon I'm going to show you where it can lead to. These tools uh, include atmospheric attenuation, interactions with imaging, non-imaging optical components, and they can be coupled to opti um, optimization algorithms. These days the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence is booming. There are many applications. In the next study I'm going to show you, we used basically trial and error method to find optimum, but that process can be made more intelligent by engaging the AI and machine learning um, tools. So let me show you an, a specific example of optimizing a plant that consists of a tower, receiver, and a heliostat field with the question, what are the cost optimal layouts, their optical efficiency, and the levelized cost of exergy? To solve this problem, my former doctoral student, Li Feng Li, developed a computer program model, optical model, coupled to techno economic analysis to basically study all possible configurations and find out what would work best under a given scenario. In this system, we have one critical component, which, which is the compound parabolic concentrator. It's not used, normally people avoid it because it's an extra component. Um, if no high temperatures are required. However, if we go towards chemical processes above 1,000 degrees Celsius, this becomes an inevitable component, but it is something to, um, to carefully design and integrate. The process was to define a large heliostat field, then take a small subsection of heliostats in an elliptical cone, and then to uh, optimize this um, small heliostat field. How it was done? First of all, if you look at the shapes of that heliostat fields will have when varying the tower height or the acceptance angle of a CPC or the tilt angle of a CPC, you will see that the heliostat field shape changes from an ellipse to parabola to hyperbola. That was the first pure geometrical consideration to set the boundary to our optimization problem. Then for the selected sets of configurations, the optical simulations were run and then the uh, characteristics were uh, calculated. For cases without the concentrator, with the concentrator, for maximum efficiencies you can achieve by any possible optimization optically. And then as a byproduct you obtain here the levelized cost of exergy, which is for the two cases uh, where you see them here at the bottom. You can see that this cost of exergy, the useful energy, explodes when you don't have a CPC, but you want to have a high temperature in the receiver. The receiver, this plant is non-economic. It makes sense to add that component. Okay? Now, these are the maximum efficiencies, but it doesn't mean these are the, this is the cheap energy. The, so the further optimization was to find the cost optimal layouts and within them to understand what the efficiencies would be for performance of the receiver, heliostats, the field, and the whole system. I'm not going through all the details because I have many other topics yet to show you, but I want to basically send a message. It's all possible with enough combination of optics, techno-economics, and time. That's, that takes time. Maybe artificial intelligence is something that can help us here to, oops, to do it at a large scale um, for industrial applications faster. Now, it took about more than 10,000 simulations to find configurations for, without CPC and more than 40,000 simulations to find configurations with a CPC. At the end of this very tedious process, 
when we found the envelope values, the optimal cost, optimal values, the optimal layouts were identified. And now if you know that you would like to operate at high temperature, for example, 1800 Kelvin, it is probably better to use a CPC and then you will have more power and some heliostats may not perform well, but the CPC will still gather the otherwise spillage energy and use it for something useful. So this is, these are the results basically for the set of assumptions we made in this study. This is the outcome layouts of heliostat fields that a company now can go and build. Now let me switch to solar thermal receivers, the next element in our multi-scale travel, right? So we have dif different types of receivers, volumetric receivers, cylindrical receivers, cavity receivers, bladed receivers. They all operate under different conditions for different applications. And particle receivers, which can be falling particle receivers, like the one studied at the Sandia National Laboratories in the Gen 3 project or particle reactors operating at higher temperatures with chemistry going on on particles right away when they are directly irradiated. Um, here I want to mention one particular program in Australia, the Australian Solar Thermal Research Initiative, where receivers were studied, developed, and in the context of a... Oops, in the context of a model plant. So in this model plant developed by Astri, we have the collector field, we have the receiver, we have the heat transfer medium, heat exchanger, the storage, and the power block. Interestingly, the sodium, liquid sodium, is taken here at the heat transfer medium to transfer heat from the receiver to the downstream to the application. Sodium um, is a metal, normally a solid metal, but you can melt it at a little bit more than 90 degrees and it will start boiling at more than 880 degrees. Okay? So this uh, metal was actually used as a liquid heat transfer medium in the plant demonstrated by the company Vas Solar in Gemalong, New South Wales in Australia which had the nominal thermal power of six megawatts thermal with five modules, three hours of thermal storage in liquid sodium in a container. And now it is already decommissioned. I learned recently that it worked well, its function is finished, and the company has a new plant that is taking the technology to a new level. Here we have a photo of actually sodium as a solid metal. So, one word of caution, sodium is highly reactive with water, and this is not new to solar engineers. The nuclear engineers explored the pathway because liquid metals have been used for nuclear reactors as cooling medium. They are, the, the motivation to use them is their very superb thermal properties as compared to water or gases. Helium is also there, but these metals have really interesting thermal uh, properties. This is the application. For my former student Siddharth Ear studied this problem fundamentally, in particular the problem of boiling sodium. If there is a hot spot in non-uniform irradiation, there can be vapors of sodium created. Sometimes they are desired, but sometimes may lead to the failure of the receiver. Siddharth spent his entire PhD program um, study to understand effects of certain effects, such as the superheat, which is the excess of receiver temperature over the saturation temperature of the sodium vapor, to understand the bubble, sodium bubble vapor growth process. And I'm not going to dig into the physics I'm showing in this one schematic. If Siddharth was here, he could give you a one-day lecture on what he has done. It's fascinating, but it's a... I, I want to move on with the next problem, which is not a liquid metal as a heat transfer medium. These are solid ceramic particles. Um, motivated by the work by Sandia National Labs, as well as CSIRO in Newcastle, in Australia, my student, Jing Jing Chen, developed a model that studied the thermal performance of falling particle receivers where particles are falling from the hopper at the top of the receiver, exit at the bottom, and they directly absorb heat from the concentrated flux coming through this open aperture on the 
on the side of the receiver. The ceramic particles can withstand very high temperatures, they have good um, heat capacity, and now they can be used downstream for power generation applications, or they can be also used for chemical processing. And now there are projects around the world demonstrating different uses of this approach. Now, the, the model that Jingjing has developed um, is based on the mass momentum energy conservation equation. And here is the only equation that I promise you is coming, which is the radiative transfer equation. This is the equation that governs the transfer of radiation, solar radiation or thermal radiation in general, through a participating medium. That's the intensity changing along the path. And then it's augmented by emission inside the medium, like the hot particles. They operate at temperatures around one, easily at 1,000 degrees Celsius. Then we have the attenuation and scattering terms. The novelty here at the fundamental level in thermal sciences was to set up the entire model for polydispersed particles. Normally, it is assumed that particles will have some average diameter in a cloud. Now, Jing Jing resolved that in the size distribution. And particles of different size, when they interact with light or with radiation, will heat at different rates, which means small particles can be heated faster. Larger particles have different inertia, different optical properties. And this is all accounted in the model developed by um, Jing Jing. As the hydrodynamic model base, she used an existing code from DOE called MFIX, and she coupled her Monte Carlo server, and then she used the standard methods of hydrodynamics that come with that solver to simulate the entire system. I'm going to show only very selected results here. The velocity is in the gas phase, so we have the receiver. Here is the aperture with incident radiation. Oops. Second, here is the inlet of particles, and you see these disturbed patterns in the gas flow, which are the falling particles basically affecting the gas velocities. Particles themselves are shown here, and there is the clear drift effect because the aperture is open and there is a lot of circulation of gases exchanged with the atmosphere. This is what happens in these receivers. Um, the simulations accounted for light particle interactions, particle turbulence interactions, and also spectral properties of optical properties when interacting with light, which is a challenging program, problem, but it's very interesting. And this has been completed, um, and uh, Xi Jinping has published a number of papers on that subject. I'm showing here some heating rates, so the, the what we want to get from this is the maximum absorption of sunlight by falling particles, right? And we want to minimize the losses. I'm not going to decipher these plots. It's a lot of noise also because that's the nature when you deal with polydispersed systems and you have a lot of data. I want to tell you, the, the higher are the values in this plot, the better. And the same in the second plot, the difference is for different numerical parameters. but here we have the convective heating, which means the particles take um, energy from light and then they transfer it to the gas because we cannot have them in vacuum in these devices. Um, and then we have the temperatures for the particles and for the gases. Okay, so now I'm switching to the second part of my talk, but uh, the time is actually running out. I'm going to show you a few key points from the solar chemistry part. I prepared here some more details about introducing in detail the principle of solar thermochemistry. One aspect I want to explain here is the combination of thermal and electric energy when we want to run a chemical reaction. In this case, the thermal dissociation reaction, compound AB into compound A plus B. Now, if this reaction was to proceed at lower temperature, most of energy would have to come from electricity, like in a traditional <coughs> electrolyzer. Once we start heating the system, Thermodynamics tells us that there is more and more space to provide energy in form of heat while we eliminate electricity. 
Somewhere here we will have the high temperature electrolyzers operating. At, at a critical point, which is the spontaneous reaction at the decomposition temperature, actually any reaction can be driven only by heat. So water can be split at ambient temperature by an electrolyzer. This is now what happens everywhere with photovoltaics. But if we had a reactor like the one developed by Professor Fletcher at the University of Minnesota, and we could heat the water to very high temperatures, more than 4,000 Kelvin, it, water would be split to hydrogen and oxygen just by heat. And nobody wants to do that because it's dangerous, it's complicated. It can be also done at slightly lower temperatures, but uh, with some uh, additional tricks without putting electricity there. The same can be done with metals. That's the basis of metallurgy, and that's the basis of potentially solar thermal metallurgy. Um, and now, in solar thermochemistry, we only use heat. We can make fuels, and we can also produce chemical commodities and other processes. So, here I, I'm showing certain term, uh, some selected thermochemical reactors, directly heated, indirectly heated. I work on some of them, the zinc decomposition reactor, the calcination reactor, and the reactor that we built recently at the Australian National University for driving redox cycles for thermochemical energy uh, storage. Now, one interesting area within solar thermochemistry is to uh, develop solar redox cycles where we first reduce a metal oxide and then the reduced metal oxide can be used to um, water, CO2, or oxygen to produce hydrogen, carbon monoxide, or nothing. This nothing is actually heat. If I oxidize a reduced metal oxide or metal, I release heat. And that's the way we can store thermal energy at very high temperature for energy storage applications and not fuel production applications. There have been many redox cycles studied out there, and this table is almost intentionally too small, so you cannot see all the symbols. But I want to mention this is the second link between the solar thermal and nuclear. The first one was the liquid metals for cooling nuclear reactors or as a heat transfer fluid in solar receivers. Some of these reactors, uh, redox cycles, were developed actually to utilize waste heat from nuclear reactors to split water and produce hydrogen in the 70s. France was leading the way. Um, so the idea has been actually adopted by the solar thermal community. And here we have the UT3 cycle, University of Tokyo cycle, which is for nuclear applications originally. And um, has been adopted by the solar thermal community and has been studied even further. There is a lot of research in material science. What kind of new cycles can be invented to split water and carbon dioxide more efficiently than the state-of-the-art cycles. My student produced a map showing Shali, she produced a map of efficiencies that are possible with certain assumptions with the state-of-the-art materials and what would be possible in red color if we find better materials with thermodynamic properties that we know what they should be, but we don't know how to make a material to have these properties. So there is a lot of challenge. We call it a vector for research. It's like recently I watched a Korean drama on the airplanes, and a student from the 90s communicated via a radio with the student from the 2022. And then uh, it's the same here. In the case of our radio, we have here basically a thermodynamic model, right? It's a, so let's see if the community will pick up on this and they will find what happens, uh, what materials can provide these properties. There was even a cover page in a journal with, when we published the results. Now, the Syria is the, currently the material that most of the splitting cycles have been used. It's a, Syria is used in high temperature electrolyzers, high temperature fuel cells, and it has been used in this redox cycling. Um, there have been several reactors built, demonstrated, even scale up, and the group of my former supervisor at EH Zurich took it the longest way. They basically demonstrated the whole system of taking sunlight on a dish, taking air as a source of CO2 and water to the process, and producing jet fuel 
at the output. So this has been done, it's sealed. It, the process has been uh, scaled up at IMDEA Madrid on a solar tower. They published the results in Nature and some other high impact journals. So it's a great achievement in the field. It's a highlight for the entire field. It's a pure thermal process. There is no electrolysis. In 2020, we had a, another AIC symposium to celebrate Professor Steinfeld's legacy in the field. And it was online because everything was uh, closed. Um, and then we met over the entire week with the uh, many keynotes, invited talks. This symposium led to a special issue of solar energy, which we have just finalized. So if you are interested about the content, I encourage you to have a look at this volume. Now, we, at ANU, we also develop a new material, cerium vanadium. Vanadium is known, uh, ceria vanadia. Vanadia is known for, uh, from flow batteries. So, and then we added it to ceria. There is a nice synergy between properties of ceria for uh, reduction and vanadia with some catalytic properties. We built a new material, um, reticulate porous ceramics, and this has been tested. It showed good performance. I can show more details later on if you have some questions. Redox cycles can be used for thermal energy storage. We had one project over a couple of years at the Australian National University based on the material developed at the University of Colorado Boulder, which was a mix mixture of iron and manganese oxide. We built the reactor, it was tested in the new solar simulator, and the, average efficient, the peak efficiency for this reactor demonstrated was about 9%. Maybe not a very high value, but um, it was the, basically the beginning, and right away it went um, there. I mentioned something about the project of uh, Aldo Steinfeld. Uh, they took CO2 and water from the air. It is suitable to even to be done in the desert because there is humidity in the air in the desert. So you don't have even to have access directly to water um, in the ground. One of the technologies behind that has been taken to the commercial level by the spin-off from Professor Steinfeld's group, um, the company called Climeworks. And now they are scaling up this um, in Iceland. And um, there is a demo plant also in Zurich. At ANU, we have done CO2 capture using carbonate chemical looping, uh, which is suitable for higher concentrations, not for atmospheric CO2, it's too, not enough there for that process, but higher concentrations from flue gases, for example, combustion of biomass, to recycle CO2 back to some process. The same process can be used for thermal energy storage, solar energy storage. The main material we considered was calcium carbonate, but there is also strontium, manganese, magnesium, barium, and some other materials. They have, the, mat the process has high energy density, about three times that of molten salt energy storage, but of course it comes with chemistry, higher temperature, so there are other challenges to be um, dealt with. Years ago, I worked as a doctoral student on the project of just solar calcination, the first step of the chemical looping process at Pauscherer Institute. We built two reactors, directly irradiated and indirectly irradiated reactor. This one was the highest efficiency of thermal processing by then um, in the field in excess of 40%. Um, percent. I continued with that topic in the at the University of Minnesota. I had a grant there. We built, designed a reactor to realize sequential um, calcination carbonation reactors in a single reactor. And the experimental work was just co finished during the first stage of COVID in Australia. It took us a decade to finish this project. And you see the reactor in the solar simulator there, irradiated by the lamps. Um, and here are some results, as very uh, selected results of cyclic operation. The black line is the CO2 partial pressure. It will fluctuate depending on which stage of the cycle is for variable numbers of cycles um, realized. And my second last slide. I really hope you will forgive me this delay. Yes, thank you very much. But I want to show this slide. It's probably the most important for me in this presentation on solar ammonia. I think this is the process that has a very large potential uh, for 
various reasons. Um, when I started to look into it, I first uh, learned that the name comes from the Greek name Amon of the Egyptian god Amun, which was the god of creation and fertility. And then I learned that the god Amun fused with the Egyptian god of sun, Ra, and they, there was a god Amun Ra. Then I thought, then we should have solar ammonia. There is no way around this. And, well, the sol ammonia is now produced through the state-of-the-art process called the Haber-Bosch process. It's called the brute force process. It requires elevated temperatures but very high pressure to push nitrogen and hydrogen together into an, uh, an ammonia molecule. And the catalyst is ion. Nitrogen is the most abundant element in the atmosphere, hydrogen in the hydrosphere, and ion is the fourth, fourth most common element in the crust and the main one in the core of the earth. So we have only common materials and we would produce ammonia, which can be used in industry already. It's, there is a lot of industry um, using ammonia for fertilizers and some other applications, but also for combustion in engines, turbines, rocket engines, fuel cells, and also as an energy storage medium. Therefore, it is proposed as the leading material for carrying hydrogen in the global trade that, may, that is being, of hydrogen that is being now envisioned in many parts of this world. So I hope there is there could be some interest also to work on this process here for a few reasons. Uh, one of them is that a solar thermal energy can be theoretically used to synthesize ammonia at lower pressures, almost ambient pressure. That would be a leap, a step forward, big step in the, in the field. And at ETH there were some papers published on possible routes via nitrate chemical looping. It's a higher risk route right now. It requires more research, but theoretically it can be a purely thermal process by skipping um, the, by skipping the um, Haber-Bosch process, traditional one, and also by avoiding electrolysis. Electrolysis here is typically used to produce hydrogen as the input to, the, to making ammonia. I would like to acknowledge the funding I, and institutions that I have worked with or supported me over the years from um, in Switzerland, in United States, and in, the, in Australia, um, including people that work for the projects in the, associated with free software. This is, I acknowledge the work because I have used free software extensively over years and my students, and it helped us to work on research in solar energy. And I would like to acknowledge the um, mentoring roles of my, prof of my professors, Professor Stanisław Pisarczyk in Warsaw, who put me on the research track when I was in my second undergraduate year. By then I studied environmental and water engineering and I added renewable energy. And Professor Aldo Steinfeld at ETH Zurich and two colleagues from the radiative transfer community with whom I interacted and worked a lot, Professor Michael Modest and Professor Loni Dombrowski. Of course, I want to mention the work of all my students, postdocs and collaborators, including the ANU Solar Thermal Group. This is the group as of November 2018, before the difficult times came to Australia related to the pandemics. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Wacek, for this very academic presentation. I know that uh, Australia has launched a very important hydrogen strategy. I think since five years ago, uh, starting from the production towards the implementation, passing by the transport, all that. You have visited Proteas yesterday, and, and uh, what can we say about the matching point uh, between uh, one big island, which is uh, 
Australia as a continent and uh, our uh, island and uh, with uh, the facilities that you have seen yesterday in Proteas because we have a very important development plan for hydrogen. So what could be the matching point maybe uh, in the storage? What can you explain for us more? Uh, thermal storage and transport for that. And the second question concerning the nexus also. So uh, it's really very important now to think uh, with the nexus concept and the nexus spirit. So how can we consolidate uh, the nexus through the concentrated uh, solar uh, power uh, uh, facilities? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Komar, for the questions. Now, hydrogen is a big topic in Australia. It's investigated in the context, not only as an energy carrier, as a fuel. Actually, that one is not clear but it is a great chemical input in chemical industry. It can be used to reduce metal oxide. If you have hydrogen, you can reduce iron ore to iron, for example, and that doesn't require very high temperatures or electricity in the metal, molten metal oxides. Um, hydrogen in Australia is also considered as a uh, future export commodity. Now, Australia, you know that Australia is a, big exporter of mineral resources, coal and also metal, metal ores and so on. Um, um, uh, hydrogen can be exported, can be a form to export Australian renewable energy resources, solar but also wind, everywhere in, in the world, in particular to countries like Japan that have big industry, are energy hungry. And there is a project, there are projects that want to realize that um, not just through the pure hydrogen route, but also in form of ammonia. Ammonia is the hydrogen vector. And uh, the work is really intense, uh, including the CSIRO, the Commonwealth Scientific and Research um, Indus uh, Industrial Scientific Organization. And um, now, what, uh, when we move slightly from hydrogen to water, first of all, uh, we cannot have hydrogen without water. Uh, if we envision the global hydrogen trade, and hydrogen will be one of the important energy carriers, it's very easy to understand that there will be a high demand for water. Hopefully, well, in a circular economy, the hydrogen that is used, spent, oxidized, it produces water again, right? And then it comes back to the environment. But there will be Probably it will be a uh, distraction to the environment when this hydrogen e economy kicks in. In concentrated solar thermal energy, water is used directly as a heat transfer medium. So the thermal plants use water uh, to, in the ranking cycles. And that's another point of discussion. Can we build these solar thermal plants in deserts where there is no water? You need to bring it, but you need to replace it, refresh it, and so on. Yesterday I saw the Proteas facility and I saw that there is the um, solar receiver with heliostat field, so that's the, basically a thermal, solar thermal facility with, that provides high temperature heat. But there is also some photovoltaics facility, there is a desalination facility. It comes together and I think this is the, the very interesting take solar plus water together. It, in the United States, um, there was a strong program at MIT, solar and water and mechanical engineering, and also was promoted in professional societies, AICHE, the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. So um, we can use solar thermal energy to, uh, first of all, process water, process uh, waste water, process uh, sewage water. That's already something, some specific processes. But um, I mentioned Sahara, right? So there is a lot of sun, there is no water, and if uh, this process continues as is, Sahara will eat up all land around. So solving these big challenges requires that we look both how we can use solar locally and um, solve also the water problems. I see there 
a host of uh, topics that can be designed for research, and not necessarily only on te technical, technological level, but at the system level, where um, we could uh, probably, where it will be necessary to work that way. No, you cannot solve the energy problem without solving the water problem in the south, particularly. Because the north, they have water, but no sun. In the south, there is sun, but maybe not enough water. And there will be some big scale global optimization how to realign this uh, you know, availability with demand. Thank you. Uh, there is an, uh, a question from an online participant. Uh, that's why I'm asking it from Art Lensky. Um, what is the energy loss at the stage of transferring heat to electricity when liquid metal or solid ceramic particles are used? What is the first part? What is, what is the energy loss at oh. the stage of transferring heat to electricity? Well, uh, at the research stage, most of energy is lost because we are interested to understand physics. But um, theoretically, if we talk about the um, absorbing radiant, radiant heat in a receiver that takes it then into uh, by, by liquid metal or particles, the only losses, theoretical one, are the re-radiation re losses. I showed the Fletcher plot with the absorption blue lines and the red lines. Because as long as we just want to absorb heat in a liquid metal or particles, there are no, we don't lose uh, energy because of the second law of thermodynamics. Now, if we go from that point to electricity generation or chemical reactions, that's another another topic and it depends on the application but theoretically are the losses governed by the uh, plot by the radiation losses in the best black body receiver that is perfectly insulated in practical situations you always have 20 30 percent going through the walls through conduction through convection at the aperture and, and so on it can, these numbers can vary broadly Hello, it works, yeah? Um, thank you for the presentation. I wanted to ask you, um, it seems that C CSP that is known for many years now is kind of uh, it's losing the game against uh, thermochemistry, or at least it's the beginning. Um, so this, uh, this, this is a challenge. What are the challenges, basically, uh, that might be brought by the fact that we use uh, hydrogen as a main um, energy source uh, in terms of uh, utilization, transport, and so on. I heard a comment once also that hydrogen is highly volatile, so it may go also somewhere in the atmosphere that we may not like it to be. So how do we, can you speak about that, please? Well, uh, hydrogen volatil volatility, volatility is not directly connected just to CSP. If you produce hydrogen within uh, electrolyzers, you still have that problem, right? So it's, uh, these are the, the coupled problems a little bit. Um, now, hydrogen, producing hydrogen with solar thermal via redox cycles, for example, the thermal routes, uh, adds more value to solar thermal and I personally think the field will evolve towards polygeneration systems where the highest step will be to use, even the receivers will be shaped as multi-aperture receivers to shave the peak for the highest temperature application, which is, for example, water splitting in redox cycle, then spillage radiation for lower temperature applications and so on. And then when you make hydrogen using these redox cycles, the efficiency of the process is still not very high and people think that's the reason that we are losing the game with electrolyzers. You cannot ex exactly recover heat from an electrolyzer that easily, but from that process, I can take the rejected heat and use it to drive a power cycle, and I can cascade the energy flow. One reason that uh, I think there has been less uptake of CST versus electricity that I, as an individual can go to a 
department store and right away can buy a small panel with a small electrolyzer and I don't need any capital venture or a big consortia, right? So the, it's easy to start with photovoltaics, but photovoltaics scales linearly with size. Basically, you keep adding modules and you have bigger device, but in solar thermal, there is, the initial, there is an initial big step. And then with size, I showed some, the, the cost reduces very, you know, the, basically there is a size, the scaling effect in CSP. So um, there is, it's an economic problem a little bit rather than technological problem, how to get the first capital, the chunk of the investment, and then the field probably, once the industry is there, it will sustain itself. But it is a little bit like maybe not a good comparison with nuclear fusion. Initially, it's hard to start it, but once it burns, everybody believes it will sustain going, right? The, the sun is working. Uh, so I think it, there are, it's a combination of economic and technical aspects, but uh, polygeneration would be a very nice way to integrate chemistry with power and also at the lower stage, those lower temperature like desalination to also add to the water energy nexus uh, question. <clears throat> Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation, full of challenges. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, I hope that uh, CSP is not going to follow the path of uh, nuclear uh, fusion, which is so promising, but always uh, 20 years away. We, uh, we don't say uh, that. <laughs> so, uh, the, um, I'll get very specific. Uh, you visited Prodeas, I'll follow up on what uh, Professor Comer said. Uh, it's a polygeneration facility. Most people think it's, it started as a CSP, but it's a polygeneration uh, facility. So that uh, we're on the right track, according to what you said. Uh, but I would like to, and also you heard that our plans about uh, uh, high temperature electrolyzers, which are well suited for CSP. You correctly pointed out, uh, in my view, the tremendous role that ammonia as a hydrogen vector will play. Uh, and it's very important also for Cyprus because it's the dominant proposal now for decarbonizing shipping. Uh, it's, it's ammonia. Uh, that's uh, the prevailing, uh, I, don't, I just stated for, to frame my question. Um, looking at Cyprus, okay, let's assume that we are successful with the high temperature electrolyzers, which are well treated geographically to Cyprus. Uh, ammonia will produce the hydrogen. Uh, is, in your view, a research path for Cyprus, or you produce the hydrogen, let's say, uh, the way we want to do it at Proteas, and then you buy an ammonia uh, 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 composition uh, device with this, that technology. So, should research stop at producing the hydrogen and go commercial? to go from hydrogen to ammonia, or it's a field of research? Um, it's a field of research with a variable research component depending on the technology path you chose. If you choose the electrolysis, even the high temperature electrolyzer, and then the Haber-Bosch process, there is still some space for research on the processes themselves, because the high temperature electrolyzers, they are in the R&D stage themselves. They are not done deal yet. Uh, they are getting very efficient. They are getting better, but uh, it's, uh, let's say, a little bit behind the low temperature the, the electrolyzers. Then the Haber-Bosch process uses catalyst, which is ion typically, right? There is a game in the field how to lower these pressures. It's a problem. and. In the traditional industry, the units are large, so the industry can somehow do it at once. In distributed renewable energy systems, there will be units of ammonia, for ammonia synthesis that are smaller in size. And in small units, you really, it's, I believe, not so convenient to work with these high pressures. So there is a, a the path here. Now, for specifically solar thermal route, we can 
omit completely electrolysis and Haber-Bosch and try to find a thermochemical path to uh, synthesize ammonia through a chain of chemical reactions. And that's a low uh, research. That's a, um, let's say, a little bit longer term, not a little, longer term research. But it's, the game is worth risk, I believe. And uh, the next aspect, beside technologies on ammonia, is not just to get hydrogen, but also to understand the integration of systems. Even if we go with components that we can buy, electrolyzer, we can buy Haber-Bosch unit. I now know of companies that can ship the turnkey micro Haber-Bosch synthesis device. Um, but if we want to scale up, there is system modeling people should look carefully how you integrate these devices with energy sources, electricity, um, PV or wind or grid broadly. And uh, so it is more tailoring to the local conditions. And Cyprus is smaller than Australia. So probably there, there are a little bit. <laughs> There are some anal um, analogies, but there will be, of course, the local specifics that one should take into account. Take, thinking of the small electric grid, relatively small electric grid, and if you put such a large industrial electrolyzers and something goes wrong with them, the whole country may lose electricity. But I don't want to be a you know, pessimist, but it's possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Rybinski, for this very interesting and very technical talk, I have to admit. Um, I'm just going to follow up with, uh, from Professor Pangola's question. Uh, and we discussed this yesterday briefly. Um, what's your view on the other derivative of hydrogen you haven't talked about, methanol? Because um, ammonia is the one that's being talked about most, but that, there's also that option. Yes. Would you, what, how would you um, value the merits of one against the other, and what would you think about its application in Cyprus? And if there would be a research line down that direction? It's a very good question. So you saw basically just one slide of the project at ETH Zurich when I showed the solar synthetic hydrocarbons, right? It's a most advanced, the whole pathway has been demonstrated for the most ambitious approach from air and sun to kerosene. Um, solar hydrocarbons or the hydrocarbon fuels, I believe they will stay as long as we will have uh, aviation, long haul aviation. There is really not a competitor in the classical energy space unless there is some science fiction solution that we don't, cannot think of today. Um, for longer uh, distances, yes, there, are, there is replacement. For uh, ground transportation, I think there will be a competition among electric and uh, maybe ammonia technologies with hydrocarbons, but in a, if pol there will be political decisions that we move towards fully circular economy, sustainable economy, then it means any carbon emitted from using hydrocarbons has to be taken back, to be in the loop. And the taking back carbon from the atmosphere at the concentration of 400 parts per million is expensive energetically and also economically, right? So the, this, the, the process of optimi optimization will naturally occur, and some applications of hydrocarbons may die. Some others, like I believe aviation and niche transportation for heavy duty machinery, maybe shipping, you know, uh, ammonia is photos, that's a good fuel for shipping, but maybe diesel will still be more economic. And there will be companies willing to pay the price for carbon capture in a market economy. I'm not talking about the initiatives or political centrally steered economies. I'm talking in the market economy. Um, because the hydrocarbon fuels offer a lot of advantages, technical advantages. We have mature infrastructure. We know how to handle hydrocarbons in every form in gaseous liquid uh, form, in engines, or we know how to store them. And one aspect that is very important, safety. Hydrocarbons are relatively safe. They are not toxic. Of course, we have spills of oil, but ammonia is toxic, for example. And that's one thing to keep in mind, right? Um, and beside that, uh, we, there will be 
there are alcohols. So you, I mentioned hydrocarbons, then you have methanol, ethanol. I think if it's of biomass source, and uh, there is, a, you know, the, it, it is an alcohol based on uh, sustainable carbon. I call it renewable carbon. It's a fantastic way to go. And in agriculture, maybe people will recycle their agricultural waste to drive tractors. We touched upon this yesterday. We talked about BEX. Uh, biomass in that case, is, is it really a viable option for Cyprus, using that as, an, as, as a source oh, of carbon? Uh, technically, of course, but now Professor Komar will tell me where are we going to tell water to grow all this biomass, right? So if you, do, if you make progress with your forward or reverse osmosis fast enough to provide f water to the agriculture, then we can grow biomass, and having the biomass, we can have uh, biomass base fuels in Cyprus. It's all connected. I think the, this optimization process, by economic, natural, not because of one political decision, will require some time, and there will be winners and losers, and you know there will be success and drama. Hopefully, all no drama, more success, but it's going to be, you know, it's, the world is not homogeneous. Not everybody thinks in terms of sustainability, right? Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. We can continue the discussion outside, of course. Thanks. Thank you very much.